this final uh, video lecture will deal with uh, Croatia. Uh, Croatia is a, an interesting case study, uh, one that is um, useful to discuss uh, because it transitions us from um, uh, the region of uh, Central Europe to the uh, region uh, that we will um, not uh, examine further of um, the, uh, the Balkans, the countries of former Yugoslavia. For example, we will not study in detail uh, Serbia, we have to make such choices. But we have this last Bosnia and Herzegovina, which kind of is uh, <laughs> clearly a very uh, deep uh, uh, inquiry into, into the problems generated by the post-war uh, settlements in the, in the region of uh, former Yugoslavia. Of course, one of the probably the most uh, complicated situation actually in that, that whole region, um, so which makes it so interesting. Uh, Croatia, however, will, um, as you will notice, uh, is much more a post-Yugoslav society than uh, than we saw in Slovenia, right? Uh, as you as you as we discussed, um, and on, on the same time, at the same time, uh, when we think about the history of Croatia or of the Croatian uh, people. We already know that uh, historically and culturally they have, they have been part of the more or less of the Central European sphere, but really at the border. At the border physically, at the border uh, culturally, at the border politically. Uh, the very existence, for example, of the Serbian ethnic groups in the eastern part of Croatia, which gave rise to all that bloodshed in, uh, during the wars in Yugoslavia, is due to the fact that during the Ottoman occupation of Serbia and uh, territories, uh, many of them uh, emigrated, moved to uh, what today is Croatia, and they were employed by the Austro-Hungarian Empire or the Habsburg Empire as uh, you know border un uh, patrol units. I mean, the whole region, all those villages were the border um, uh, before uh, the advent of the modern line borders, right? That whole region was the border and the people who lived there literally were, the entire region was employed, so to speak, or subsidized by the Hungarian Empire to be a border, you know, uh, the border legion, so to speak, right? So, you know, being at the border is something very real uh, and uh, with, with long-term consequences. So anyway, uh, what um, do we have to uh, know about uh, Croatia in terms of its transition? Well, uh, unlike uh, Slovenia, Croatia's transition was not immediate, right? Just like in the post-Yugoslav and ex-Yugoslav societies, Serbia and so on, the first 10 years of the, after 1989 were actually spent in state and nation building. Of course, the wars in uh, Croatia ended in 95, uh, but the entire decade was spent under in the shade of nation state building. As we discussed in this zone, this region of the post Yugoslav, ex Yugoslav uh, uh, countries, uh, that was that delayed the transition. And, and this, this actually is, reflects, uh, is, is similar um, to what happened in Serbia. In Serbia, Milosevic was removed in 2000, that's when the actual democratic transition happened. The 1989 was in 2000. Same here in, in, in many ways. Although the wars ended in 1995, the leader who came to power in 19, um, uh, immediately after 1989, 1990, uh, Franjo Tudjman, uh, he actually stayed in power until the end of the 90s. So the same situation happened, even if the wars ended uh, earlier. So to, to start with the beginning, uh, in 1990, uh, you have a democratic uh, so-called democratic party, uh, the, um, uh, you know, called, calling itself a democratic party, but which was actually a nationalist uh, party, right, uh, coming uh, to power, uh, removing, uh, uh, basically removing the, the communists, and finally Tujman becomes president. And the entire 90s will be spent in, in, in building up, uh, const constructing, managing to secure the existence of the Croatian state and quote unquote Croatian nation. So the entire 90s were spent on this. So the, the first, just like in Serbia, the first, um, the first you know, uh, uh, election after 1989, after the end of communism, were not a transition to democracy, but were a, trans were a transition to nationalism in the sense of nation and state building. 
And that, you know, as we discussed, is the precondition to have democratic transition, is to have a state, right? Uh, well, that was, uh, you know, itself was a question mark. Literally a, a, a huge question mark being that um, uh, they uh, were involved in war, and you saw the documentary, that um, the struggles they went through to, uh, to uh, have an army, right, to establish an army, which is one of the core institutions that, that uh, core, core institutions among those, that set of institutions with sovereign power over territory and membership that we call a state. The state doesn't exist, right? The state is a set of institutions. Unless you have these institutions um, uh, that, that have the power to, to impose sovereignty of this state, uh, there is no state. Right? This is why it was a war, and this is why it was such a bloody war. Uh, this is why secession, uh, when it's not with the agreement of both parties, is bloody. Right? Because sovereignty is exclusive. If you, you either are sovereign or you're not sovereign. Right? There's no midway here uh, in the traditional understanding of the, of the nation-state. And this is also reflected in the constitution that I posted online, and I'm going to read you to, uh, ask you to read the, the preamble, the first part of that. Because there in the constitution you see uh, that in the preamble there's just a long list of things. And what are those things listed there? They are basically listing the history of Croatian statehood. Now, why would you do that on a constitution? Well, obviously, think what it was when it was written, right? It, it, they were setting up. It was an argument, just like the Declaration of Independence in the U.S. The constitution in the in that Croatian constitution is a justification of the existence of the very state of Croatia uh, and of the nation, but of the very state of Croatia. So they build on that uh, history of political statehood of existence of. That's the point they make in the Constitution, that uh, statehood has, has always existed, uh, Croatian statehood has, has always existed to a degree, uh, and, and through, through, through certain institutions. Notwithstanding the fact that, as you know, uh, for about 900 years or 1000 years, uh, the Croatian lands were part of the, uh, of the Hungarian Kingdom, but remember they did have, right, they did have their own set of institutions uh, with the Sabor and the Ban, the governor, who had jurisdiction over that territory. So they were in a sort of a uh, subordinated um, um, uh, part of this uh, uh, Hungarian kingdom, but it, they weren't uh, dissolved, assimilated, incorporated. So that's true. Right? And, and that's, that's what they make a point. And again, we don't make, you only need to make a point if someone, such points, if someone challenges your interpretation or your justification for existence of statehood. Now, in the 90s, that, the whole 90s, and especially the first half, was about a very real, very acute challenge to the very idea of Croatia. Okay. So, uh, so uh, this, this, the party then that, that takes power in the early 90s uh, comes, you know, uh, replaces the communists, but instead of moving towards democracy, it moves towards nation and state building. Well, in case of war, there is no time for democracy. In case, and that's true in any place. Uh, you know, think of the United States under Lincoln. Lincoln suspended habeas corpus. Uh, you know, in the Second World War, the Japanese Americans were interned in labor camps and so on. Right? It's always there's always a suspension of democracy to to larger or smaller degree, and that's indeed what happened in the 90s, because these were the uh, Franjo Tuđman, uh, Fra the Franjo Tuđman had HDZ. Uh, the, uh, uh, the party that replaced the communists were actually the, you know, the nationalist party, right? Uh, they were the unique holders of power, and he was the person who fought for the existence of the Croatian state, and he was the unique holder of power. So it's not surprising then that uh, in the 90s it turns out that Croatia did not have democracy, but it had a so somewhat, it had an illiberal democracy, or maybe even authoritarian regime. I would argue for an illiberal democracy, in which all the power was concentrated within Franjo Tuđman, a sort of a founding father of the, this modern state, uh, um, and, uh, and with a, a certain group of people who supported him, grouped under the HDZ uh, you know, party, um, uh, which uh, is... Uh, you see the, 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 uh, the letter H in all the names of the party, this H stands for Hrvatska, which is in uh, Croatian means Croatian. 
So this is where you need to see the, the, the letter H everywhere. So this uh, Croatian Democratic Union uh, was HDC, um, was, was the force that dominated politics in the 1990s in a non-democratic context. And this is very important to understand, but because in 2000 you will have a coalition removing this sort of a illiberal ruling party, right? And why 2000? Not because they removed Franjo Tuzman by force, but Franjo Tuzman died of old age in 1999. So the 2000, with him gone, um, you know, the, the hero that gained uh, sovereignty for Croatia and so this towering figure, sort of founding father of the Republic, um, with him gone, the, also the party that supported uh, him could be removed. And indeed that happens in 2000. So the actual uh, democratic transition is delayed with 10 years, it happens in 2000, the same will happen also in Serbia. Uh, on 19 Slovenia, right, because where the democratic transition is in 92. But the interesting thing is that as an outcome of this delayed democratic transition and of the fact that you had an authoritarian regime, communism, followed by an illiberal slash authoritarian regime, well, illiberal, let's put it that way. Authoritarian is, is false because there was civil society, there was you know, freedom of speech and whatever, but it was still it was in the hand of one group, you know, power, in the sense that you know, you know, they were the holders of it and benefited from it, you know, corruption and all those things. Um, so um, the interesting thing is that as a result of these you know, succession of you know, one on authoritarian regime, communism, and then an illiberal regime, which needs to endeavor state and nation building. In, after 2000, you have various types of uh, you know, um, uh, uh, you know, uh, reform parties, right? Because first of all, you have the reform communists from before, right? Which now will be, as we know from the other uh, countries, the social democrats. And you will also have the reform HDZ, right? Uh, as you'll see, and then other parties. But we'll talk about that. In any case, del in any case delayed transition delayed transition to, uh, uh, to democracy. Uh, what can we say about Croatian society, right? It's fairly homogenous. They emphasize the homogeneity, but it's not entirely homogenous. It's 90% is ethnic Croatian, and the rest, about 10%, which is large, is are ethnic minorities, of which the largest are the Serbian, with 4%, and then the Bosniaks, Italian, Hungarian, Slovenes, Albanians. Now, it's interesting also that in the Constitution, uh, it's emphasized that Croatia is a nation-state, uh, it's a nation state, well, but you know why they emphasize this, because it was the tool through which they claimed statehood, just like in the US Declaration of Independence, they emphasized the fact, the right to be different, to be something else, and then claim statehood, the same thing, you have to define the nation to claim statehood, and vice versa. Um, uh, in, in this case, they, they say it's a nation state, but they also say in the Constitution, you see how it's a, it's a mix of two things. Uh, that these ethnic minorities also are constitutive of the state. Now remember from the Slovenia uh, lecture that um, um, you had a different approach to this, uh, where you know you had indigenous ethnic minorities and non-indigenous ethnic minorities, and so on. But this is a this is a different uh, way to deal with to cope with the situation, uh, by which. <coughs> These are considered ethnic minorities in the nation states, however, as ethnic minorities, they do consider them constitutive of the state. Interesting. Also important here is to ask the question is how about the Croats who are abroad? And I'm not talking about those who emigrated, which is a one category and it's large, but I'm talking about, you know, having had Yugoslavia and knowing that to think Bosnia and Herzegovina, there's a large ethnic Croatian population there. How do you relate to how do they relate to these Croatians? And there's also northern Serbia and so on. If nationhood being defined ethnically, they will also be part of this nation. And indeed, somewhat similar to to the um, uh, situation, to the tactics, to the uh, uh, tactic applied by uh, the Hungarian state versus the ethnic Hungarians who are in the, you know part of other territorial states. Somewhat similar happened also in, in um, Croatia uh, that you can claim Croatian citizenship based on ethnicity. So, Croatian, that ethnic Croatian population from Bosnia can have, 
you know, can claim uh, Croatian citizenship and then they can vote in Croatian elections. However, they don't vote in the regular elections. They have special districts set up for the diaspora, just like in Romania. Right? Remember, remember that in Romania you have, the diaspora has three, basically, seats, three districts, uh, you know, for different parts of the globe. Well, here you have Croatians in the countries of former Yugoslavia, especially Bosnia, where obviously third of the population is ethnic Croatian, and somewhat in northern Serbia, but you also have Croatians elsewhere around the world, Western Europe, many emigrated there, America, Croatian-Americans, and so on. But all of these can claim Croatian citizens, and they have reserved seats. Um, and uh, the, the, the way the electoral system works is that they can have anywhere between 1 and 12 seats, depending on how many of them vote, show up to vote. So that's an interesting factor. You see the combination of elements from other countries, right? One, extending the definition of, 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 of well, the state using, the Croatian state using the fact that the state is not just the state over a territory, but the state uh, over a membership, using this thing to expand its, its, its membership, right? By granting membership to all those who claim it based on ethnicity, not on territory. So. The state runs the territory, just like in Hungary, but it's also the state of all the ethnic Hungarians around the world. Same here with all the ethnic Croatians who want to be around the world. So, that's also interesting. Um, also, uh, talking about the state, uh, it will not come as a surprise to, or maybe to, uh, to, to note that, that Croatia considers itself and is a unitary state. Now, it should come as a surprise in the sense that Historically, as you know, there have been different regions that sometimes have been, sometimes have not been associated under similar um, structures. And remember, the Croatian state ceased in around the year 1000 or 1100, you know, then you had these administrative units, but rarely were these different provinces united under those administrative units. So you have Slavonia, Istria, Dalmatia, Dubrovnik, I mean, these were all uh, you know, very distinct uh, uh, entities, sometimes, you know, one was under Venetian control, the other Hungarian, the other Austrian, this was, in, then it, was, it had its own thing, uh, Central Croatia, Royal Croatia, and so on. This is why we examine this history, to understand this complexity. But it's not a surprise that Croatia is a unitary state, from the point of view of when it is defined, right? It is defined during this actual war to uh, to, to, to save, to, to establish, and to maintain a state, right? So, when you establish statehood, during that, so you declare statehood, and then it's immediately followed by war, right? Well, you can't declare it as a federal state, you can't declare it as a confederal state, because what you need is a strong central authority to defend that territory. So obviously it will be unitary, and you also want to defend from any claims of breaking parts away, you don't have you don't want to give them borders around which they can carve out the territory. Okay. So it's a unitary state. Um, however, the main unit of administration is, in local administration are the counties. Remember the municipalities were the main unit of uh, local, of sub-state administration in Slovenia. Well, in Croatia are the counties because historically the counties have had, uh, uh, you know, uh, administrative power and these are historical counties hence me posting those uh, the, the map of the counties with their coats of arms these coats of arms reflect the fact that these are historical counties nonetheless okay you declare it unitary you make it the main uh, form of administration the county nonetheless there are strong regionalist parties in Croatia not unsurprisingly right I mean unsurprisingly it's not surprising that you have these because the history and the culture of Croatia is regional. It is regional, right? There's no Croatia, right? There are different lands, provinces, right? Just like in Romania you have Transylvania, Wallachia, Moldova, very different. They have been leveled during communism, but the echoes are still there and there, is, there are strong regionalist currents in Romania as well. But just like here, and you will see that they will play a role in politics because politics expresses these cleavages in society. Okay, so how about the political system? Well, during the 1990s, the political system was a very strong semi-presidential, even presidential system. So let's call it a very strong semi-presidential. Well, obviously, it was a system built around Franjo Tuđman. And also, then it comes as no surprise that in 2000, when the ruling party, after Tuđman dies and the ruling party is removed, um, you will have a new government and 
uh, constitutional reform. So let's look at the political system as it looks after the constitutional reform. Now, your, the different sources will approach it differently, uh, and you will see some of them mentioning parliamentary, parliamentary. Well, I think that ar we can argue that it is somewhere, it is either, it's just like the Czech Republic, it's in between parliamentary and semi presidential at this point. Uh, the semi presidential dimension has, rema has remained there. I mean, it has not disappeared. But they have strengthened to a good degree, to a large degree, the parliamentary uh, dimension and have taken some of the key tools of the president from his arsenal. So I would argue it's in between parliamentary and semi presidential. Uh, you can call it a parliamentary with a very strong president, you wouldn't be, you wouldn't be far away. Uh, from the fact. Um, so let's look at it. So you have the president, which here is the thing, and you see on the link to the page of the presidency that they emphasize the fact it's an extraordinary position because it's the only directly elected uh, position which is elected by the entire country, right? Representatives in the parliament are elected by the district, this is elected by the entire country. And the president has all, uh, all kinds of uh, roles that are listed on those things, I'm not going to go over all of these. Uh, but it's important to know that, okay, he nominates the PM and whatever, and his roles are more ex accentuated in foreign affairs and military, where he can appoint ambassadors, shape foreign policy, uh, and has some roles in defense and appointing officers and so on. So those are some practical, concrete roles uh, that fall within the president. In terms of domestic politics, however, he has less roles. He can nominate the Prime Minister after elections, as usual, uh, but he cannot veto laws, and that's an, interesting, that's an interesting weakening of the power of the president, as you can see. Uh, so that's the president. Uh, then, the parliament. Um, as a fairly small country, I think the population is about 4 million, um, a fairly small country, uh, you would expect them to have, well, you, what would you expect them to have? Having a union and cameral parliament would not be a surprise. But guess what? During the 90s, there was actually a bicameral parliament. And it's only in the constitutional reforms amendments uh, to the, in 2000 2001 that they have changed it to a unicameral parliament, unsurprisingly called Sabor, which is the familiar name we have encountered from Croatian history, which has been the diet, the assembly of the nobles throughout history. So the Sabor, which is directly elected through PR. Countries of uh, Central Eastern Europe, most of them adopted variations of PR, as you saw, with the 5% threshold. Okay. Um, in the, as you'll see in the election results of the last, the last elections where I left the details in, um, the, <coughs> the, the, the size of the summer is uh, small relatively, you know, uh, moderate to small, 100, between 100 and 151. Um, Members. What I want to point out is that there are 10 districts, uh, the country is divided in 10 districts, right? Where you have each of them producing lists through PR. And in addition, there is a separate district for the Croatians living abroad, meaning Croatians in other countries, the diaspora, yeah, that I mentioned, the, city, the Croatian citizens abroad. And there's also a district for the ethnic minorities which uh, are not elected through PR, obviously, as always, they would never get elected uh, with 5% threshold. Um, uh, but all of them do get elected, uh, do have a sort of an election, and most of them do get represented with between one and three seats. The Serbian minority has, in the last election, three seats, and many of the others have one seat, and they left that in the last election online. Okay, um, obviously, after each election, the majority of the parliament forms the government, meaning uh, the prime minister uh, usually is Asked, is the head of the leading party or coalition, which the president and asks to form a parliament. It needs the approval of the sub subor to form the government. The prime minister is the main engine of policy in Croatia, so here's where it looks like a parliamentary system, um, especially in internal affairs, not just in external affairs and army. It's basically that they have to cooperate, but there the president has some significant roles. Uh, but in internal affairs and running the economy, running the country, is the PM and the cabinet that are the most important uh, tools and instruments. Um, furthermore, in terms of the judiciary, uh, as you saw in Slovenia and in other countries they have studied, the, there is a, there's the regular system of courts and separately there's the constitutional court 
and I'm going to leave it at that with the note that the President uh, has role in appointing members to the Constitutional Court, also an important um, uh, system. By the way, the electoral system used to be SMD-FPP during Tujman, this era, which assured that the largest party got most of the seats in the parliament. It's a majoritarian system. Proportional, moving to proportional, as you see, was moving away from a, from a more authoritarian, illiberal regime. Now, the US has SMD-FPP. Okay. And the parliament has all the roles that you uh, have uh, the, you have been accustomed to, uh, including, interestingly, uh, ensuring the civil supervision of armed forces and security services and deciding on border changes and granting amnesty. Usually amnesty is given by the president, no, here it's given to the parliament. So you see how this is a reaction to the previous, probably, uh, previous um, sort of uh, abuses of presidential power, too much power to the president. Pardons usually don't go here, or, or amnesty doesn't it's not here, located in the parliament. Um, so you see that they have taken important security law and order uh, functions and given them to the sovereign. Okay, so we talked about the first elections after 1990, in 1990, where the nationalist forces HDZ come to power, they rule with Tujman on, uh, throughout the 90s, it was a time of nation and state building and so on. In 2000, you have another election after the death of Tujman, when the opposition six, a coalition of six parties opposing the dominant Croatian Democratic Union, HDZ, removes them from power. This looks like a democratic transition and the first free election, so to speak, although the previous were free as well. Um, Indeed, it's this delayed uh, transition. Uh, I also posted um, uh, on, uh, online um, two series. Uh, first, uh, in the first uh, document of materials, I posted the list of prime ministers and of uh, presidents uh, up to basically 2010, 2015. Uh, because I don't want to go through all the elections individually. We will only talk about the last two elections, meaning those of this year and the previous ones. So, um, if you look at the list of the prime ministers since since uh, 2000, you will see that they come from basically two parties. Either the Social Democrats, who are basically the Reform Communists, they're more nostalgic towards former Yugoslavia, more eastward looking, more Balkan, looking toward the Balkans, so eastward versus westward. Versus the Christian, uh, Croatian Democratic Union HDZ, who were the former, you know, the nationalist uh, state and nation building party, which are which are center right, conservative nationalists, and so on. Uh, same. Um, if you look at the president, Stephen message, the one that was elected, that was uh, president for two uh, terms, which is the maximum of five years, which is uh, for how long the president is elected. Um, <coughs> Uh, he uh, was an independent in 2000, so, uh, and the next one was from the Social Democratic Party. This points us to the fact that, uh, the, uh, here's what I wanted to get, is that the dominant parties since 2000, until recently, have been, uh, well, just a few. First of all, HVZ, the country that built, you know, that established the Croatian state, uh, the, the, the centre-right party, who is removed in 2000, but comes back as a reformed HDZ in 2004. Sounds familiar? Yes. It's almost like in Central Europe in 1990, the, uh, uh, the opposition wins, but fails to make all the reforms, and in the next election, the reformed communists come to power. This is why creation is interesting, because here you have two reformed parties, one the reformed communists, and the other one the reformed nationalists. None of them with a nice history, right? Plus, however, so the other ones would be then the S, uh, uh, SDP, the, the Social Democrats. Then you have regionalist parties, and this points out, points to which are a staple of Croatian politics and reflect the history of Croatia. And you also have another party that by now should be familiar, uh, which is the Pensioners Party. Uh, it's called the Croatian Party of Pensioners, HSU, but that's the state pensioners. Okay? You saw that in Slovenia. Okay, and there are some others. I'm not going to go further into uh, uh, which, which have been around since 2000. The Laborists, which is a 
Labour, remember the, the UK model, the sort of a left-wing party. Then you have a, a peasant party, which is a historical party, just like other places, but maybe we can have peasant, labor, whatever. But these are small. Okay, so let's look at the, at the um, uh, more recent uh, elections here. So 2004, remember, AD, first, so first election 2000, an independent president, and then uh, the parliament is won by a coalition of anti-HDZ opposition. 2004, HDZ come back as a reform uh, and, uh, and wins uh, the election, so HDZ gives the prime minister. And the prime minister was uh, Ivo Sarandev. Ivo Sarandev, you see, prime minister for actually two, uh, two mandates, um, uh, two, so for two mandates. But he doesn't fulfill his last mandate, because Ivo Sarandev, this leader of HDZ, just like in Slovenia, he actually gets prime minister. He has to resign because he gets involved in a corruption affair. He is prosecuted and goes to jail. Okay. So here's the thing, right? Who was the after the demo, after the end of communism, right? The first you have uh, those who took power and maintained it during the first decade. Also, were the sphere of actors that also had the, ch the chance to put their hands on certain economic benefits with, you know, privatization and so on. In Croatia, not necessarily with privatization, but with the fact that it was uh, an illiberal government, the same group in power, they could also, you know, benefit materially from that, and they have done that. Patrimonialism, kindism, and so on. But who was that party? It wasn't the SDP, it wasn't the former ex-reform communists, which, which was the case in most of the other countries, but that those were the first to put their hands on stuff uh, coming to power in the second election. Here it was, it was HDZ, and this was one of their leaders. Okay, um, so as you see, it's not bound to ideology. Who gets to put their hands on what? Uh, so anyway, so he gets involved in this in this corruption uh, scandal uh, in between the 2008 and 2000 normal election, I mean 2011 elections. Um, so be, be, before the 2011 elections, which are early elections, uh, uh, HDZ, which had been in power for, for two mandates, uh, is, is deeply hit by several things. One by uh, the fact that its PM gets thrown to jail. Uh, on the other hand, it is faced by a fragmented left, so, you know, HDZ. HDZ, uh, the Croatian Democratic Union, is a very well organized party, unlike other parties we have discussed, meaning that it has deep roots in the society, it has base, while the Social Democrats in this case are actually more elite party, interestingly enough. So it's very important, all politics is local, it's, you know, how strong you build yourself on the ground. But, what happens between 2008 and 2011, these two elections? Well, um, uh, uh, what happens is that you have the 2008 economic crisis, of course, first and foremost. The 2008 economic uh, uh, crisis will hit, will obviously hit um, uh, Croatia uh, very uh, hard, right? Uh, and you will need to make some some reform. Second, you have these corruption scandals that discredits HDZ. Uh, so that that is a double hit. Uh, and too much ADZ around, also people get tired of it. Uh, so in 2011, here's what I wanted to get, it is actually the, the sort of a broad anti-status quo opposition on this, of the center-left, which is called the Kukuriku coalition, which is basically a cock do do Well, it's quite telling, the name isn't it, because it's about waking up reform and so on. And that's when? 2011. Around the 2010, you know, remember our discussion that around 2010 you have all this wave of anti-status quo reaction and so on. However, this is led by an established party, the Social Democrats, an established but sort of the opposition to the establishment HDZ, uh, and, and others, including the regionalists and the pensioners and so on. Well, unfor uh, unfortunately for the Kukuriku coalition and for SDP, who wins the election in 2011, and also the presidential election in 2010, with an independent candidate who was supported by the center-left, 
Unfortunately for them, they are not able to pass serious reforms and the Croatian economy keeps dragging its feet for the last six years now. Uh, so by, this, by the time the, these years' elections came around, the, the Croatian population is very dissatisfied. There is high unemployment, about 17 to 20 percent, and about 50 percent among the young. So that's, that's really bad. Um, and these, the uh, although they have implemented reforms, austerity reforms, they haven't been successful. Maybe they should have gone the, the path of Hungary or Poland, uh, Hungary and Polish the government, which didn't take these. Their, their, reform, their reforms were not neoliberal austerity-based reforms, as, you, as we talked, but they, they took their own path and they were successful, although very criticized when they reformed their economy by you know, putting, putting the burden on the banks and not on the population. They managed to actually do that. Well, that's a whole different discussion. Anyway, they implemented austerity reforms as they were indicated by IMF and EU and whatever, but it failed, it failed, and people, you know, austerity reforms, you mean, you cut services, you cut benefits, people suffer, and where is the turnaround? I'm not saying it's good or bad, right? It's, it's just a, you know, a fact. Okay, so we get to 2010, and you have presidential elections, which are basically always, this is why it's listed as 2009-2010, because the presidential elections are at the end of December, and then January the second round, right? It's a too bad at the presidential elections you've seen elsewhere. So this is why it's two years, basically. 2009-2010, and Ivo um, um, uh, Josipovich, so that's in 2010, uh, this is the one when Josipovich is helped by the Soviet Democrats wins, and then the most recent one is 2014-2015. And Ivo Josipovich runs again, he's very popular, that, that president who, who came to power in 2010, uh, who was like in 2010 came to power. Uh, and, but, and everybody predicted that he's going to win again. He, remember, he's an independent, but he's backed by the ruling Social Democrats. Now, by this year, by this time, the ruling Social Democrats, this Kukuriku coalition, is extremely, extremely unpopular. So, Ivo Yosipovic, who should have coasted to victory, and in fact, in the first, in the first round, if you notice, of 2014-15 presidential election, he gets more than the, the rival, Rival was supported by the HDZ, who had all those problems with corruption and having in the party of Tujman and everything. Well, uh, they, he loses in the second uh, round, with very, very narrowly, by the way. You can see how, how narrow uh, this is. And this is very telling that, that the division between the center-left and center-right is so narrow. Both of which center-left and center-right, remember, are sort of reformed formerly illiberal uh, parties, right? Reformed, sort of a reformed communist becoming social democrats, reformed HDZ becoming, well, reformed HDZ. However, their candidate was quite, you know, good. Uh, oh, first of all, a woman. Second, she has been uh, an ambassador. She has worked in the level of the EU. She has been the assistant to the NATO secretary. So a very <laughs> successful experience uh, with good image and very, you know, competent and obviously you don't get to be all of those things uh, unless you are competent also at the international level and not just to, you know, rubbing elbows with your fellow uh, politicians in your little pond. So she proved her, 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 her worth, uh, you know, uh, through uh, in, in international politics and we would assume competence and she is the candidate and it's a very, as you see, that's a reform, that's a, that's a good image, that's a, that's a positive candidate, right? It's a positive candidate uh, of the center-right. So they can be accused of being, you know, the Tujmanites, whatever, right? Um, or corrupt, because this is a competent person. And it's also important that she's a competent person because they're the head of HDZ, he, who would become normally the, their candidate for the prime ministerial position in the following parliamentary elections, he's one of the most unpopular politicians in Croatia, the head of AGZ. Now, fortunately, he wasn't the one they ran for the presidency. Remember, however, that the presidency is sort of a secondary position in the Croatian political system. So, not so many people show up to vote as in the parliament election. However, it is a bellwether, sort of a, and it's considered to be a sort of a midterm bellwether election um, to kind of point out to where things are heading. And indeed, this is where things are heading. But beside, before going to the parliament elections, Let's notice this person here, Sinčić, who is uh, the candidate from the 
uh, a party or group called the Human Blockade. Well, that's an interesting name for a party, isn't it? Yes, we are talking post-2010 elections. Uh, we are talking about this anti-system reformist, non-political parties, just like you see in all the other countries. This is it. This is a young person who, fairly young person, who um, who <coughs> is the candidate for a sort of a civic association that used to stage blockades to forestall the foreclosure of, of, of apartments and houses by the banks. Now notice that here you have a popular reaction trying to stop the banks from, you know, um, foreclosing and so on. It's a populist reaction, right? Not just popular, but populist. Notice, remember that in Hungary and probably in Poland you had the government doing that instead of the citizens. If the government does that, you take out that issue from from the population. It doesn't turn against you, but you do it in the interest of the population. Well, no wonder they elect you. Yeah. Okay? The outrage that came in 2008 because of the behavior of the banks, which you have witnessed here with the Occupy movement, with the Tea Party, both of which were related to that crisis and it was a reaction to the incompetence and fraud and whatever it was, just, you know, whatever it, we want to call it, shady deals of which the people suffered. Well, many certain countries around the world have chosen to to put the burden of recuperating those damages not on the population but on the banks themselves. Iceland is an example, and it was very successful. Hungary was another example, uh, and so on. Uh, so here it didn't happen. Here it was the traditional way of you know just cut. We're going to just cut expenses. So it's still again the population will carry the burden, and the people are extremely dissatisfied and seeing it hasn't solved the problem. And you have then this popular movement against this popular reaction, populist reaction to that. And that's what you have here. And look at it. 16% of the population voted for this whoever he is. <laughs> Newcomer, right? Okay, so that, that gives you a sense. 2015, uh, actually just a few weeks ago, you had the uh, election to the Savo. And notice that what you have are great big alliances, coalitions that run. There's the Patriotic Coalition on Center-Right led by HVZ. Uh, it tells you, Center-Right, Nationalistic, whatever. There's the Croatia is Growing, which is Center-Left, led by the Social uh, Democrats, um, Laborists, Pensioners, and so on. Then you have Bridge of Independent Lists, or MOST, which is um, uh, split from HVZ. Uh, and it is mostly non-political, independent politicians. So here you are, the same thing, uh, non-people from the outside, outsiders, against the status quo, reform. But these are, so these are independent politicians, mostly local politicians, remember localism, right? Traditional localism, who are fixed on economic fiscal responsibility, on economic and administrative reform. So reformists, actually prepared, so not just civil society, you know, whatever, uh, like, uh, not civil society, not just, you know, populist reaction like Sinchich, but actually p people who have been in local government and have training and, uh, and have a plan. But, you know, they come from the outside. And notice their name, uh, well, Bridge, actually, is uh, of independentist, Bridge, most, right? Notice, they get 12% of the vote. While the two major coalitions, center left and right, get almost identical, uh, actually identical number of seats in the continental Croatia, in, in, the, in the country, 56 and 56, same number. Then you have most with 20, that becomes the, uh, you know, the important party to form a government. And then you have some others, which is a regionalist party, remember the regionalist uh, parties that have a long-term uh, presence in um, uh, in, uh, in Croatia, and some other left, and uh, another regionalist, and the human blockade, notice they don't really do well. After the presidential elections, human blockade is only one, uh, well, perhaps the, those votes went to uh, most. And you have uh, progressive, neoliberal, whatever one, They're not that important. But here's where they, the, the, the diaspora votes, the, the, the vote for the diaspora college, become very important because the District 11, which is the diaspora district, Croatians living abroad, meaning the diaspora that we talked about, they give 
unsurprisingly, all their votes to the nationalists. Because that's price always more nationalists than the people at home. All three seats go there. So basically, if you collect all the votes, it will be HDZ who numerically will be the winner, not a majority by far, it's a slim plurality, but HDZ will consider itself a winner. Still, it cannot form a government. And then you have the, 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 the ethnic minorities, three, four Serbians, and then Hungarian, Italian, uh, Roma, Albanian, and Czechoslovak. Good. Now, uh, Here's the problem. Who's going to form the government? You have center left, 59. Center right, no, center right, 59. HDZ left coalition. Center left, 56. But they usually would get some votes from labor, solidarity. They usually would get some votes from the ethnic groups. So they would have some. But still, none of them would have majority. Because the kingmaker, as the articles that I posted um, uh, discuss, is the most, is the bridge. Uh, is the bridge, uh, this bridge, most uh, new party of independent, fiscally responsible, sort of uh, non-political politicians, so to speak, um, local politicians. But here's the problem. Such, we discussed this, politics is a specific, is a game played by a specific set of rules. If you enter in this set of rules, you play according to these rules. That makes you a politician. Politics is not a bad name, a bad word. Politician is not a bad word. Now what you do within the system and how if you abuse you know some of the rules of or power it's a different thing. But what, being a politician means that you play by these rules, which are the rules of which are rules that are set up to to um, to transform conflict that is inherent in a society into co common action, collective action. All these different views in the society are being fought out in these coliseums, uh, in these cauldrons, in these stadiums, which we call parliaments, by certain rules, and what comes out of this are laws, are go is government. Okay? This is why it's messy there, in order for it not to be messy in the society. And this is why it's confusing for people from the outside. But once you get there, you, need, you learn, the, learn the rules. You, know, you learn that politics is about compromise. That no matter how hard you keep to your thing, it's, you should keep to your whatever ideas, ideology. You will not reach action. Because always and always there are other opinions represented in the parliament. And you, rarely do you have majority. You always have to form coalitions with others who have a different opinion. So you always have to let a little bit, uh, give up a little bit in order to gain something. That all solutions are compromises. The politics being an art of compromise. And that is part of the art and the beauty of politics of reaching positive compromises. Not compromising your ideas, but reaching compromise solutions that bring the best, the best out of the possibilities. Politics also is called the art of the possible. But that's a skill. And, and it takes patience. And it takes patience from the population. The population doesn't, doesn't have patience. Okay? So why am I saying this? Because most, you know, one of the problems of, of, of anti-system, anti-status quo reform groups is that they don't reject these rules. They want clear and cut and let's just do it. Okay? That's not how it works. Most, however, comes from a different background, so they're not clueless about politics. However, they have a different sort of an error, seemingly, embedded in the DNA, which is that they want a government that, you know, they want all of, all of them to work in one direction, a government of national unity. Well, there is no such thing as national unity, except for issues like nation building, but we don't want that because that gives us authoritarianism and illiberal societies. Liberal societies use this multiplicity of opinions and makes policy out of that. Illiberal societies simplify it into one opinion. Well, most has been approached by both center-left and center-right, in, and invited to form a government with either one. Most at this point cannot decide. We are weeks after the election, most cannot, cannot decide with whom to form a coalition. And what they are proposing is a government of national unity. But that is anti-political. You need governments of national unity, for example, in the UK when you have a war. In the World War II, 
all parties were part of the government because it was a matter of survival. It wasn't anymore about this policy or that policy. It was about surviving the state. In Croatia, you had the same thing in the 90s. You had HDZ, it was about the survival of the state. In a democratic society, you don't have that. You have different, once the state survives, you have different ideas about policy. And none of the two major parties want to enter into such a grand national coalition, and I would argue it's wise. Because if that government fails, then the entire political system fails. The point of democracy is that there is alternation in government so that one fails, another one replaces them with hopefully a better plan, which they have time to develop. It's the idea of government versus opposition, that you need both to have democracy. Well, most wants a government of wide unity, and both of the center left and center right refuse. And I would argue, that's my take on it, that it is a good thing. It is a good thing because it's more democratic and healthier for democracy to have to not have such wide, broad government, because you need to have alternatives. Some need to be in power, some need to be in the opposition. Uh, in any case, at this point, because remember, the president at this point is from HDZ, is that lady I mentioned, right? Uh, Colinda. Um, and she can ask someone to form a government. The problem is that no matter whom she asks, unless most wants to cooperate, they cannot form a government. So what looks to be possible, we don't know yet, it's, we're in, right in the middle of this process right now, is that new early elections will be called, anticipated elections. And I wonder if that happens, who will the voters punish? Will it be most? Will it be this? Will it be this? Or what will happen? Anyway, that's where we are.